Okay, well, it's a pleasure for me to be here in Connecticut. It's been a while since I've been back to Connecticut, but it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to come to the Northeast, one of my favorite parts of the country, and particularly at this time of the year. So where are the leaves? I, w I drove up in the dark last night. Are they in full bloom? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, my talk today is about um, implementing the Common Core. I'm a big fan of the Common Core. I've been a supporter of it since day one. Uh, but I have some concerns about its implementation. But my biggest concern right now is that I have to share this podium with Freddie and John. Do you know what that's like? It puts me in, fine, in mind of one of my favorite literary characters, uh, Charlie Brown. For how many of you is Charlie Brown a favorite literary character? Yeah. Well, this is one of the cartoons, one of my favorite cartoons is that Linus and Lucy and Schroeder and Charlie Brown are lying on the baseball mound and they're looking up into the sky and they're talking about what they see in the cloud formations. And uh, Lucy says, ah, there's Madame Curie in her laboratory inventing a great new discovery to save mankind. And Linus says, and there's Beethoven, uh, oh no, he says, there's Aristotle contemplating the, nat the nature of the universe. And Schroeder says, and there's Beethoven slumped over his piano, penning the last few bars of the Ninth Symphony. They all looked at Charlie Brown and say, what do you see, Charlie Brown? He says, well, I was gonna say I saw a horsey and a doggy, but I changed my mind. <laughs> <clears throat> so I assure you that doesn't mean that this is a dog and pony show. But right. My goals for today are to answer some nagging questions as we begin the implementation process for the Common Core. Especially I want to look at this new kid on the block, close reading. I don't know what it's like here in, in Connecticut, but everywhere I go around the country, I hear a lot about this idea of close reading. And I'm, I'm you know, for one thing, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the alternative to close reading is. I don't know whether it's far reading or unclosed reading or what. But at any rate, um, that's really what I want to focus on today. But before I do that, I want to do a little survey. How many of you have a primary identity as an elementary teacher? Would you raise your hand? How about secondary? How about college teaching? Yeah. Well, you all know the difference, right? You know that elementary teachers love what? Their kids, that's right. And we know that secondary teachers love their subjects, that's right. And we know that college teachers love themselves. Right? <laughs> you don't know how hard I searched for that photo. Of that guy. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, just come to a faculty meeting at UC Berkeley sometime and you'll see a lot of that. Yeah. Okay. So what are these questions? The first one is, so what is this close reading business anyway? Second is, uh, where did this close reading thing come from? I want to give you a little history lesson, it's not a new thing, you know, it's uh, actually a pretty old thing. Actually, it goes all the way back to Aristotle. Right. Yeah. And where is it headed? And under that category, there's a, a million questions we could answer. Do we really have to forget everything uh, we learned about the role of prior knowledge and stories and comprehension? Uh, no more picture walks, no more pre-reading discussions, uh, no more on-your-own questions. What does it mean for a question to be text-based, to be text-dependent? Does it mean in that you'll be asking a lot more literal, factual questions, or are, is, are inferential and, and critical questions still part of the game, too? And lastly, if we, if we ban prior knowledge, and here's my big question to everyone, how will kids figure out whether or not what they read makes sense? I just don't know how you can do it without invoking your knowledge. Okay. So uh, close reading is implemented right from the start on all this. This is the, in the preamble, the introduction to the uh, Common Core Standards, and look at that first uh, line there, the close, authentic reading that is at the heart of understanding and enjoying complex works of literature. Now, that, that meaning of close reading I like. But look at the rest of this. They habitually perform the critical reading necessary to pick carefully through the staggering amount of information available today in print and digitally. So, so something how what they are valuing in reading must, must uh, entail critical reading too, right? They actively seek the wide, deep, and thoughtful engagement, that's John Guthrie's job to talk about engagement today, with high quality literary and informational text that builds knowledge, enlarges experience, and broadens world views. They reflexively demonstrate the cogent reasoning and use of evidence, uh, essential to both private deliberation and responsible citizenship in a democratic republic. So what's not to like? Nothing, it's everything I believe about literacy, learning, and so, when I read that in 2009, when they were creating these standards, I was really pleased to see that because it seems to me that it was, um, 
you know, really right on target. And so in 2010, I signed on the dotted line to say that these standards are worthy of our professional support and implementation. I was ready to go on the road and seek contract, uh, converts. But I assure you, the road to paradise has been a little rocky along the way. Um, by the way, just a quick diversion. Uh, I want to say something broadly about the standards. My talk is about a very specific aspect of the standards today. But I want you to know that I think broadly about the issues related to the standards. And I want to tell you what I like about the standards and what my big open questions and worries are. Five reasons to support the standards, an uplifting vision of the goals of literacy. I think the standards themselves are based upon our very best and most up-to-date knowledge about comprehension and composition. I'm not sure that the implementations are based upon that same body of research. Uh, I like to focus on results rather than means. Uh, uh, the standards, at least in principle, have a lot of room for teachers to exercise some prerogative in terms of how they actually help kids achieve them. I like the idea that there's shared responsibility between ELA and the disciplines for literacy development. Uh, I think it's not the model of every teacher a teacher of reading. It's the model of every teacher in a discipline knowing how reading and writing work within the goals of that discipline and making sure that literacy is your friend rather than uh, your, your enemy in helping kids acquire knowledge and inquiry in the discipline. That's the stance we want to take, I think, with our, our, uh, our friends in, in science and social studies and mathematics. A plausible theory of text complexity, although I'm sure that uh, Freddie will have lots to tell us about issues of text and vocabulary today. Uh, one of the reasons that text complexity is important is not, I'm a little less enamored of the idea of reading above grade level than I am enamored of the idea of helping every kid develop strategies for coping with what I call Waterloo texts. And Waterloo texts are the texts that will bring you to your knees. You've all experienced a few of those, right? in your undergraduate or graduate program, probably something I wrote or maybe something John or Freddie wrote. Yeah. Uh, and a new generation of challenging assessments that allow kids to strut their stuff. It's all about knowledge, reasoning, and critique, right? How smarter, you're a smarter balance state, right? Yeah, how did it go in the, uh, in the pilots in the spring? You know, it went pretty well in California. Uh, the news on the street was more positive than negative. The negative news was all about the technology. The positive news was all about the level of challenge. One eighth grade girl, in fact, said, I've never taken a test like this. They actually had you think about things, which I thought was pretty interesting. Here are my open questions. Can we stay, stay true to the challenge of deep and critical comprehension of text? That's my topic for today. Are we up to the challenge of uh, integrated uh, this, uh, curriculum across the disciplines? Can we meet the challenge of more complex texts at every grade level? Will we get tests to match our aspirations for instruction and learning? And most importantly, and here's a big question about the Common Core, is can we keep local en en engagement you know, and feel like at the local level we're doing our stuff and still be a part of something grander than we are, a vision of teaching and learning for a democratic society? And I think that tension is probably amongst the most difficult. As I said, I'm spending most of my time on that topic today, but I just wanted to delve a little bit into this one, and that is, are you ready for um, open-ended responses and what you get from kids when they, uh, when they say what they think on tests? Right. So this is maybe multiple choice of test assessments aren't so bad after all. Here's some of the responses that kids get, have given to open-ended science assessments over the years. Some people can tell what time it is by looking at the sun, but I've never been able to make out the numbers. You've probably recognized that one, yeah. This is one of my favorites. Now, this kid knows morphology, right? Yeah. <laughs> and finally, my favorite. Okay. 
Well, that's it. It's all downhill after this. It gets really serious now. So I want to begin uh, my talk about comprehension by uh, uh, with a demonstration. I'm going to unfold a very short story line by line. And your job is to figure out what's going on at every juncture, OK? Uh, it's, this is really it's a kind of a silent think aloud, OK? And you just do it for yourself, right? OK, here we go. The end of elegance. Business had been slow since the latest rise in the price of crude. Now, there's hardly a person in this room who can keep themselves from doing what? Speculating about what kind of business, right? Do you notice how immediately your mind goes to that? And you're probably thinking about what might fit that slot. Nobody seemed to want anything elegant anymore. Now, you have an even stronger clue about what kind of business it might be, right? It's not any kind of business. It has to do something to do with elegance. Suddenly, a well-dressed man bursts through the showroom door. Now, because you know that this is a story so far, we can draw the inference that this person who's bur bursting through the sh showroom door is probably what? The person who's going to buy whatever it is that might be elegant, OK? And headed for the most expensive model on the floor, OK? Now, you, you notice how the more information you get, the more specific your hypotheses become, right? John Ingham peered over the top of his horn rimmed glasses. And now we've got, is this the same guy who as the one who burst through the shed room chart? No, and how do we know that? We know that because if the author had meant for us to believe that they were the same person, he would have told us. Otherwise, we infer that it's someone different. And probably John is going to be, have, play a different role in the story, right? Over the one ad section of the newspaper, oh, now we know that what? He's probably the salesman, right? And things are bad, so he's doing what? Looking for a job, right? Adjusted his loose-fitting jacket to hide the frayed sleeves of his shirt. Times really are tough, right? And rose to meet the man whose rhinestone stick pin and alligator boots, but were they real? Seemed out of place amidst the dazzling array of steel gray. And you're probably thinking about what's coming next. And you're absolutely right. It is Mercedes sedans, right? OK. A little more. I'll take this one, he said confidently, pointing to the most expensive model on the floor. And if you had to predict how he would pay for it, you'd probably say cash. And what state is he from? Everybody says that. I don't know why they say that, but they do. Yeah. Uh, cash on the line. Later, the paperwork complete, John muttered to himself, I'm glad I didn't blow this one. Uh, then he added, what does he know about elegance? What does anyone know about elegance anymore? And now we know something more about John, right? He has this sort of cynical resignation about life and his place in it. And then he smiled wryly as he returned to his newfound pastime, which is looking for work by reading the want ad section. Yeah, we know that, right? So what can we learn from our reading of this passage? Well, the first thing, and I really want to hit this point home, it's not as though prior knowledge is something that we think very deeply about. It's the words in the text that compel us as readers to invoke our knowledge to make sense out of things. It's not like we have to do it. It's, it's just that uh, it's uh, the natural thing to do when we read. We also know that the more unfamiliar the ideas and words of the text, the harder it is to make a link between the text and knowledge, right? Familiarity really does matter. We learn what's new in a text in terms of what we already know. Yet we always seek the most plausible link uh, to knowledge that we can generate. So if you don't know about cricket and you're reading an article about cricket, you pick the best schema you have. As the way I look at it is when you're not with the schema you're, you need, uh, you live with the schema you have. Right? And, um, and, and I think that's really true. We do that all the time. We reason by analogy. And finally, the other thing that matters is that we're systematically linking to other parts of the text, and they're equally important to us, too. Well, that's what we do when we read. Uh, the other thing we know is that our internal standard for rendering text sensible is twofold. Does the meaning I assign to a word, a phrase, a sentence square with what I've read so far? And does, it, does the meaning you uh, assign to those things square which what you know to be true about the world. 
And those are the two most important elements in, in reading, that we monitor our reading in terms of what we've read so far, what we've understood about the text so far, but also in terms of what we know to be true about the world. This corresponds to um, what um, uh, our current um, sort of uh, model of reading that Walter Kinch has put forward called the construction integration model is, uh, and the logic of this is you construct a text space for the text you're reading and then you integrate it with what? The knowledge that you have so far and you, in, the, in that second process we do what Kinch calls building a situation model which I'll explain in a minute. But the point is, is that um, is that when you do these things, you're, do, you're, you're engaging in, the, in that two-fold standard for uh, determining the, what makes sense in what you read. So according to Kinch, we construct the text space and then we integrate the text space with knowledge to create a situation model. Some call it a mental model. And you know the interesting thing about that? Is once you've done that, you can actually change what you know. The point about reading is that it's just not about reading, it's not about comprehension. The point about comprehension is what? Learning. You actually learn new stuff, and you know more than you, you did when you started. You can change your knowledge. Now, I have built this moving model of this, so I want you to hang in there with a minute and, um, and uh, go with me in terms of this Kinch model. So here's the story of reading comprehension. Out in the world, there are these things called text. Inside of our head is a thing called the knowledge base. We sort of moosh those two things together, and we create this thing called the text base, which is kind of a model of what the text says. Then those things, two things moosh together, and we create a situation model, which is my rendition of what the text means. And then the information in the situation model is available to go back into the knowledge base, and all the wild experiences out there changing our knowledge base too, right? You got that? And then finally, when something's in your knowledge base, you can actually use it, and you can go out and change the world and do things with that. So, yeah, and this time I want to do it one more time, and you can do it with me. I'll, I'll cue you as to when you can come in. Outside in the world are the things called text. Inside our head is a, those two things sort of work together to create this text base, what it says. The text base and the knowledge base work together to create a situation model, and then the situation model is available now to change the knowledge base. And then out in the world is this thing called experience and that changes the knowledge base all the time too. And you know what? And then you can use the information to change the world. But the point is, is that this happens second by second, moment by moment, iteratively as we read. And this is we're constantly sort of sort of processing text, making sense out of it, uh, testing to see if it matches our knowledge, and then we're changing what we know. And one important theory, one important implication of this knowledge, of this model, is that when you get to page five in the story or the, or the informational piece, you know more than you did on page one, right? And when you read the third story on a given topic or the third article on a given topic, you know more than when you read the first one. So, so readers are these dynamic creatures who are always learning. So what's new and different about this model? The most important thing is um, about this model is the components, the text, the text base, the knowledge, and the the model of meaning that we dubbed the situation model. And it's a model, and this is the important thing, it accounts for all the facts and resources available in the current situation, hence the name situation model, okay? Uh, what's inside the knowledge box? World knowledge, everyday stuff, including social and cultural norms for how people behave with one another, topical knowledge, what you know about dogs, canines, mammals, and things like that. Disciplinary knowledge, what you know about how history or astronomy or mathematics works, all those things are a part of the knowledge uh, box. But so are a lot of more mundane things. You're, all your knowledge about language is in there too. And this is available to you for making sense out of things. Even phonology, certainly lexical and morphological information about what words mean and, and, and how they belong to families and the like. Syntax, genre, pragmatics, how language works out in the real world. and even orthography, how Prince relates to speech. This is all available to us to make sense out of things. And the most important thing about this model is that we're always asking these two questions. How does the current model of meaning I've built uh, square with uh, my reading of the text at hand, which is determined by this text space and the situation model up until that point, and how does it square with what I know to be true about the world, and that's the knowledge-based thing. And those are the two criteria. And this is why. 
all the people who are going around arguing to encourage kids to keep their prior knowledge at bay are just barking up the wrong tree because you can't do it. You have to use knowledge uh, to uh, monitor the reading process. And you know what? This goes double for the kids who, who come to school without the knowledge base we'd like them to have, the kids uh, for whom uh, reading, uh, their learning to read depends upon what we do inside schools. And, and we have to redouble our efforts in working with these kids to make sure that we help them access whatever knowledge resources they have uh, to gain access to the text we'd like them to read. Uh, wishing that kids knew more or knew something different won't make it so. All we can do is to use the resources they bring uh, to, um, uh, to parlay that into uh, learning the kinds of things we'd like them to learn. Well, that's what we know about comprehension, but how does that knowledge square with the new Sherf and what the new Sherf in town is saying? And by that I mean the Common Core State Standards. Is the theory of comprehension in the Common Core Standards consistent with this Kinsheed model that I've described? And the answer is absolutely. But the mapping is a little tricky, okay? Uh, so let me uh, show you what I mean by all that. So here, is, uh, here are the nine standards. I didn't put the one down about text complexity. And these nine standards, you, you know, you're all too familiar with them, and they fall into those three broad categories of key ideas and details, craft and structure, and integration of knowledge and ideas, right? And uh, um, these are also consistent with another important finding in comprehension. In 2002, there was a commission called um, the RAND Commission on Reading Comprehension, and they spent two or three years building, you know, sort of summarizing what we knew know about reading comprehension, and they had a really nice definition of reading comprehension. The process, it's the process of simultaneously extracting and constructing meaning through interaction and involvement with written language. Now, the, the notions of simultaneously extracting and constructing are important because the extracting, extracting part, we extract it from what? The text, that's building the text space, and the construction part is what? Where we, where we put it together with what we know, uh, 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 what we uh, bring to the page in terms of our knowledge base. And here's another point that they made in that report. We use the words extracting and constructing to emphasize both the importance and the insufficiency of text as a determinant of reading comprehension. That means you can't do reading comprehension without paying attention to the text, but it also means if the text is your only resource, you're never gonna get there, right? Knowledge is always implicated in the process, and that's the point I want to make about these things. Now, I like to think about the common core. You know, there's those three big areas. I like to think about key ideas and details as sort of um, figuring out, that's something akin to what I mean by what the text says, building the text base. I like to think about standards seven through nine on the integration of knowledge and ideas is about figuring out what the text means. And I like to think about the craft and structure standards, four through six, as ones in which we look to see how writers craft their message, messages to create the effects on us as readers that we get out of it, right? It's sort of the, the, the writer's craft, but it's also where we learn how writers shape us as readers, right? What are the tools they use to make us think uh, the things they'd like us to think? Now, this is consistent, I think, with cognitive views of reading. Remember, my, my simple terminology is what the text says. That's, uh, you know, that's sort of uh, the text base, what the text means. That's the situation model. And I like to use the, the term what the text does to capture sort of the critical parts of reading and how it is that writers try to shape what we think. And that maps onto key ideas and details, integration of knowledge and ideas and craft and structure. And by the way, uh, this also maps onto the way that the National Assessment of Educational Progress thinks about reading. They talk about locate and recall questions, and that's sort of you know, uh, uh, consistent with what we have in key ideas and details. They talk about integrate and interpret as a category of uh, cognitive targets that they measure on NAEP, and that's like the integration of knowledge and ideas. And then they finally talk about critique and evaluate, and that maps onto uh, the critical reading kinds of stuff. So for those of you who don't like to th see things stacked up, there's what it looks like when you, when you uh, stretch them out so you can see them all at once. I want you to notice that my words are a lot shorter than anyone else's. Yeah. Okay, 
So now we know that the Common Core standards are built upon a, a, a modern account of the reading comprehension process. But how do the standards square with the new deputy sheriff in town? And that's the implementation guidelines. And here I'm thinking of things like the publisher's guidelines that uh, Pimentel and uh, David Coleman uh, published uh, in 2012. I'm thinking of the Aspen report on close reading. And I'm thinking of that myriad of websites out there that tell us how to do close reading and the like, right? And the question is, is are those built upon the same model, OK? Well, here's what it says, the publisher's criteria about um, uh, close reading and about uh, text dependency of questions. Regarding the nature of text, a significant percentage of the tasks and questions are text dependent. Rigorous text dependent questions require students to demonstrate that they not, not only can follow the details of what is explicitly stated, but they can also, they, they are able to make valid claims that square with all the evidence in the text. The part in gold I actually agree with and was, I'm glad to see it in there. But I want you to notice how much of it is in green and how much of it is focused on the information that's explicitly stated in the text, right? Uh, text dependent questions do not require information or evidence from outside the text or text. They establish what follows and does not follow from the text itself. And I'm here to tell you that that's just not so. You can't make sense out of even a, a word or a sentence without invoking your knowledge base. Stay close to the text. Materials make the text the focus of instruction by avoiding features that distract. Teacher's guides um, and student editions should highlight the reading selection. Given the focus of the Common Core, publishers should be extremely sparing in offering activities that are not text-based. And here's what they said about where you put um, interpretation and critique. You have to demonstrate a careful understanding of what they read before engaging their opinions, appraisals, or interpretations. Aligned material should therefore require students to demonstrate that they have followed the details and logic of an author's argument before they are asked to evaluate the thesis or compare the, the thesis to others. And my question about this is, um, you know, is this really what we want in teaching reading? Um, I've tried to summarize the essence of the criteria here as just restating what I, uh, what I just stated before. But here are my concerns that come out of this. Concern number one, I think we are in serious danger, and I see it all over the country, of operationalizing close reading as literal factual recall. Uh, and I think I, interpretation and critique and evaluation are in serious danger of being driven off the curricular landscape. Forgetting that lots of other questions are also text reliant. Compare these three questions. What were two reasons the pioneers moved west? Pretend that you're an eighth grader and you're reading a chapter on westward expansion in your history book. And um, you know if you're a self-respecting uh, eighth grader and you get that question, what do you do? You go look at the chapter and you search for a, 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 a line that begins the two reasons the pioneers moved west were, and then you copy everything from there to the end of the sentence, right? Yeah. Uh, so we could use uh, that as an example of doing a sort of a literal factual recall question. But what if I asked th this question? What does the author believe about the causes of westward expansion in the United States? My assertion is, is that I could give you that question, which is clearly interpretive, right? And you would have to go to the same place in the text to find information uh, to answer that question. So my assertion is, is that interpretive questions can be as equally as text-based as literal questions. And finally, in a really heavy-duty history class, we could ask, how valid is the claim that the author writes from an ideology of manifest destiny? You know, that principle that we really did have the right to all this land, that it didn't really belong to the people who lived here before we came? Uh, and that would be a, a critical, evaluative kind of question. But where would you go to try to answer it? You would go to exactly the same place in the text. My point is, is that you don't need a literal, factual question in order to have a text-dependent question, right? And I, and I think people forget that. And I'm, I, I'm worried to death that that's what's going to happen. And it's a fundamental misunderstanding about reading theory and the research on basic comprehension process. Every action, critical, inferential, or literal, requires the use of knowledge at every stage along the way to carry it out. 
My concern number two is that we'll view literal comprehension as the prerequisite to inferential or critical comprehension. I don't mind the idea that we need to read with a thoughtfulness to the author to get the author's message clear, but I'm not sure it has to come before the, the comparison or the critique. Um, I, I could have you read text X, then I could have you read text Y, and then I could ask you to compare them on how do these two authors help develop the characters in the two stories, right? It's even a question we could ask of kindergartners or first graders. Or I could just ask you to conduct a comparative reading of these two selections, and I want you to pay attention to what the authors do to try to help develop their characters in the story. What kind of adjectives do they use to describe the character? What kind of verbs do they assign to them? You know, does the, does the character walk into a room, stride into the room, creep into the, creep into the room, uh, sashay into the room? All of those give us a different feeling. And so we could, and so my point is that sometimes the par comparison or the critique better rationalizes the close reading. Concern number three is this fundamental misunderstanding of the role of knowledge and comprehension. The text drags prior knowledge along even if you don't want it to. In the days of schema theory in the 70s and 80s, we used to have this phrase that says that the text, that words instantiate schemata. That is, you see something and you can't help but, but, but bring together a kind of a, a framework or a schema for understanding it. The minute you heard business had been slow since the oil crisis, uh, what, what did you do? You, you immediately wanted to bring in some kind of business schema. The text cries out for a schema to attach itself to it. And you know what happens? If a reader cannot attach it to something, you know what happens to it? It goes in one eye and out the other. It literally does, and they don't, they don't remember it because they don't integrate it with what they already know to be true about the world. And the best way to encourage learning that lasts is to connect it to, um, uh, to some knowledge base. As a matter of fact, the more general the knowledge base you can connect it to, the greater the likelihood that it will stay around. Uh, another role for knowledge is the role of monitoring. How do we know that our understanding is good enough? And as I said a, a couple of times, we use those two standards. Does it square with the text base and situation model you, you built? The last clause, the last sentence, the last paragraph, the last page? And does it square with what you know to be true about the world? So um, I wonder why Coleman and Pimentel are so down on prior knowledge. Uh, because that's a part of their critique is that we shouldn't have all these uh, picture walks and all these uh, you know, in, uh, discussions about what kids know about a topic before they read about it. Well, so what about prior knowledge? Uh, why has it taken such a beating in the publisher's criteria? One thought is that uh, Pimentel and um, Coleman visited some of the same classrooms I did, where we saw too much know, not enough want to learn and learn, too much picture walk. 45 minutes of story swapping about our experiences with road front runners before reading, having three minutes left to read the story about him, right? And, and, and that's a problem. And the, but the problem isn't solved by getting rid of prior knowledge. The problem is solved by a mid-course correction in which we put the invocation of knowledge in proper perspective, and we develop more, a, more of a ba balanced view of how we use it. And always remembering that knowledge is, always, is only as good as it helps you with, with understanding and comprehension. And that's the correction we want. But asking kids to hold their prior knowledge at bay is like asking dogs not to bark or leaves not to fall, right? It's in the nature of things. Dogs bark, leaves fall, and readers use their knowledge to render text sensible and to figure out what to retain for later on. It's just the way things are in this whole thing. So what's a body to do in all of this stuff? Well, I want to embrace the construct of close reading as it's evolved in literary theory, but I want to embrace it all. Um, I want to look at what the advocates of close reading say about it, and then I want to see what's worth keeping out, out of that thing. So let's do a, this is a really fast mini history lesson. Close reading came out about in the 1920s, and it was a part of a movement called New Criticism, and um, probably I.A. Richards was the, in England was the founder of it, a uh, guy named William Empson, also from English, England. But here in the United States, it was um, uh, Brooks and Warren, uh, Robert Penn Warren, Warren and Kenneth, Kenneth Brooks, who wrote a book called um, Understanding Poetry, which was the single most popular college text ever written. 
It was virtually used in every freshman English course in the United States from like 1930 to 1965 and the like. And, and, it was, uh, and it was a rigorous objective method for extracting the quote correct meaning of the text. Um, and the whole point of it was let the text speak for itself. You don't have to have a literary critic to tell you what the text meant. It's kind of like what Martin Luther was doing with the Bible. Let the people read the Bible and decide what it means. You don't have to have a clergy to tell you what it means. They, they were saying the same thing about, about literature. They also were reacting to the psychoanalytic uh, and historicism that was rampant in literary theory. And my favorite quote is, knowing what Keats had for breakfast won't help you understand Ode to a Grecian Urn, right? Um, which I don't know. I, you know, I always interested in what these authors have for breakfast, right? Um, but even um, like Louise Rosenblatt, uh, the, the, the champion of reader response, used the term uh, close reading. And for her, it was reading through the text to its connections with the reader, other books, and history. And she really focused on personal meaning. Uh, and, and for Rosenblatt, close reading is reading to transform the meaning of a text according to each reader's experience. There was a guy named Stanley Fish who's still around who uh, um, actually wanted the, the, wanted the interpretive authority to lie not with the individual, but rather to the community that did the reading. So for him, it was uh, transforming the meaning of a text according to the norms of a particular interpretive community. Uh, Judy Langer in the late 80s put forward a model that, that's sort of interesting in this re regard. She talks about reading into, through, and beyond the text. And for Langer, the into part was where you get the knowledge base going. The through part was where you really work through the text, qua text. And the beyond is the interpretive and, and, and the critical reading part. So you can see how different people have used the, the term to sort of uh, get different models of close reading. Even the guys in critical literacy, even the deconstructionists and the post-structuralists have a theory of close reading. But for them, you read through the text to get to the underlying ideological uh, underpinnings. That is, what is the subtext? What is the author really trying to persuade you to think? Okay, And that's what close reading means for those guys. I put a quote in there from Derrida. And it's really interesting because he doesn't even believe that words connect to reality, just to other words, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. My, here's my favorite. This is from Mortimer Adler. Now, Mortimer Adler is important because Mortimer Adler is the champion of uh, the people uh, who uh, are putting together uh, close reading today. This is the great books guy, right? But even he had a kind of a balanced view of close reading. Uh, and that is exactly what reading a book should be a conversation between you and the author. Presumably, he knows more about the subject than you do. Interesting, right? In the 1940s, we shouldn't be surprised about that. Naturally, you have, you'll have the proper humility as you approach him. But don't let anybody tell you that a reader is supposed to be solely on the receiving end. Understanding is a two-way operation. Learning doesn't consist in being an empty receptacle. The learner has to question himself and to question the teacher, i.e. the author. He has to argue with the teacher once he understands what the teacher is saying. And marking a book is literally an expression of differences or agreements of opinion with the author. This is from a chapter called Reading with a Pen. And his whole notion is the way you do close reading is you make marginal notes and you underline stuff and things like that. And that's what constitutes close reading. And, and I don't know if you've ever, do you guys do that? I mean. And when I write on, on, in the margins, and I even write in the margins of electronic text, I find two distinct kinds of comments. If I know a lot about the topic, what are my marginal notes? They're an argument with the author, because I know enough to argue with the author. If I don't know very much about the topic, you know what my marginal notes are? They're kind of a summary of what I think the author is saying. And that's because I don't have enough of a knowledge base to get to the level of critique. I'm barely managing a text space and maybe a situation model, right? OK. I like this guy, Mikus, who says, to read closely is to investigate the, specifics, the specific strength of literary work in as many details as understandings. 
It also means understanding how a text works, how it creates its effects at the most minute level. This is interesting because what does this map onto? This maps onto standards four, five, and six, right? Of the Common Core where we look at author's craft. And Bertoff had a nice way of saying it, attending to the interplay of saying and meaning. And that to me reminds us of the Rand, reminds me of the Rand um, model of simultaneously extracting and constructing meaning, uh, which I like a lot too. So what's a body to do? Well, first of all, I think we want to embrace the construct of close reading. But we want to make sure it applies to several purposes for reading. I think we can read to get the flow of ideas in a text, and we can read closely for that. We can even read to expand our knowledge base. Uh, what, do we, what do we see in here that we didn't already know? We can read to compare uh, a text with another uh, text or with a body of experience or knowledge that we possess. And we can read to critique. How good is the argument or the craft? Uh, what's the slant or bias um, uh, and the thing? And all of these approaches can interrogate the text. And here's my definition of close reading. Interrogating the text to support claims about what the text says, what it means, or what it does. And that's my definition of close reading. And I want to include all of those purposes because I think that literal comprehension, interpretive comprehension, and critical comprehension can all be instantiations of close reading. And that's really my, the, the essence of my message today. So what we need to do is to develop a set of routines or to you know, rely on routines we already have to enact these purposes for close reading. My surefire strategy is one that I learned from my high school sophomore and um, uh, senior English teacher, Mary Ubogi at Healdsburg High School. Uh, in the period in which um, you know um, new criticism was rampant in our high schools and the like. And for her, it was all about warding claims about what the text says, means, or does. So I want to put you in a position of a reader for a moment, and here's a text for you to read, okay? And your job is to answer two questions about this text. What do you think, and what in the text makes you think so? Okay, so take a minute to read the text, and then you can... Uh, Write down a few things about anything that you want to uh, claim about what you think you know from reading this text and what in the text makes you think so, okay? Now, as soon as you have something in mind, you can share it with your neighbor. I'm licensing talking to one another, you realize that. Okay, I'd just like people to share one or two, uh, uh, one or two uh, examples from either yours or your neighbor's thinking about this. Um, Anybody uh, speculate about whether or not he really was a smoker? Yeah. And, um, okay, so what were some of the opinions you got about that? Well, I didn't hear that. Go ahead. Bought it for a friend. Right. Yes, that's uh, an, an interesting. And what makes you think that? Okay, uh, that we'll, we'll accept that as long as you can point to some textual evidence over there in the corner. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what do writers do? They make text ambiguous. They give us clues to support one or another point of view about something. I mean, isn't that the essence of poetry, uh, is having just enough language uh, to rationalize different points of view about what the text might mean? The point about this activity is to get the kids into a, a, a frame of mind that, that says that, A, you, uh, uh, you, know, you, you can um, put forward any, uh, any claim you want to make as long as you can be what? point to something in the text that rationalizes your, your, uh, uh, your uh, support for that claim. And, um, uh, and it's a, a great activity to use at just virtually any level, all the way from K 
kindergarten all the way through uh, high school and college. Um, if there were world enough in time, and there isn't, uh, I took a very mundane chapter out of a third grade book. And the reason I'm using this particular book is it's in the public domain, and I don't have to worry about um, you know, uh, reprinting it. But it's, it's this little story about the kids. There's, there's lightning striking on the field, and they have to get rid of the soccer game. And there's this sort of know-it-all dad who is taking his kids out to the car and going home, and these two kids you know, save them because they realize that that's a bad place to go because there's a big tree out in the lot and the, you know, the lightning might hit the tree and fall in the car and so it's all about their saving him. And what I've done with this text, and it'll, uh, I'll put this on um, my uh, website www.scienceandliteracy.org and you can, you can look at the examples. But what I did is I took this text, which is about five or six hundred words, and I developed three different uh, ways of doing close reading. The first is really mundane, and that is just to generate a, a set of story map questions that make sure that you query all the fundamental details and shifts in the text, like you know when there's a new initiating event and a, and, and, and a, a, a new action and then some kind of reaction to it, uh, dealing with the setting and the plot and, and character development in the story. And, uh, and what I would do for this is simply to uh, embed questions at key turning points in the story. And that's one model of doing close reading to sort of ferret out you know, the fundamental uh, moves in the plot of the story. Another, another way to do close reading, and you can see the questions I have there, a second model of doing close reading is to do what I, st uh, what I call stock taking. And what you do in stock taking is you simply identify key points in the, in the story or the, or the text where you want kids to sort of compose a group summary, take stock of what do we know now that we didn't know before. And then at those key points, you simply encourage kids uh, to, to talk about you know, what they've learned in this last segment they've read. It's kind of in the spirit of um, reciprocal teaching. You know how in reciprocal teaching you stop every once in a while and summarize what you just read? And it's very much in that spirit. So I just identify these key points uh, where I would stop and do that stock taking activity. And, and the whole point of it is that you could say anything you want uh, as long as you could point to something in the text that justified your doing it. And here are the kinds of questions that I think lend themselves to that. So what's going on here in this part? Um, what do we know now that we didn't know before? What's new? Uh, what's the author want us to get out of this part? Or so say something. You know, any of those things will get kids into a kind of a stock taking mode. Uh, a third pass through close reading might be to go in and look at author's craft. This particular text lends itself to an examination of the role that figurative language plays, because the author uses a, a lot of idioms and uh, and, uh, and and metaphors in it. Like it looked like someone had just pulled off the bark with a giant potato peeler talk about thunder rumbling, talk about eyes widening. The interesting thing about eyes widening is that when your eyes widen, they don't really widen. They actually get more long this way. Uh, but uh, you know, and then uh, there's one, one other one. And these are all in the spirit of second pass things. We could read this to examine figurative language. We could read it uh, to learn about the weather. We could learn it to, uh, we could read it to learn about how the author shapes our attitude toward different characters and what language he uses to sort of uh, uh, shape those attitudes. And we could even read it to infer what we might, what might have been going on in earlier chapters in the book. And my point is, is that there's a lot of ways to do close reading. We can do close reading for various purposes. And here's the point, as I put purpose on these next three slides in gold to, uh, uh, to emphasize the fact that it all depends upon your purpose, what you want the kids to sort of take away from the experience. We can do textual readings, where the point is to get to the meaning, uh, is to get to what the author says. And these are all questions that I think promote that. Uh, we can do comparative reasoning, where we focus on how this text is diff different or, or similar to other, other texts. Texts that you read about uh, in the previous paragraph, you read yesterday, last week, or, you, or even ones you do from, from third grade. Those are all legitimate ways of doing comparative readings. And you can do critical readings. What do the author's ideas tell me about 
his or her familiarity with issues of ecological balance. How solid is the evidence she brings forward to, to support that argument? Uh, and uh, you know, you can do what I call utilitarian readings. How can you exploit the resources of the text for research you're doing, or to find good examples to emulate? Uh, so the um, point I want to make is that close reading, what is it? Interrogating the text as an evidentiary uh, source to support careful thinking. Or where did it come from today, Coleman and Pimentel? Yesterday, the new criticism of the 20s and 30s. Where is it headed? Right now, toward literal comprehension, but we're going to fix that, right? You know. uh, do we really have to forget everything we learned about the role of prior knowledge? No, but we have to stop indulging at the trough of prior knowledge. What does it mean for a question to be text dependent? It means that the text is a key source of evidence for all questions, literal, interpretive, and critical. And if we ban prior knowledge, how will kids figure out what they make, how what they read makes sense? We can ban it, well, kids will still use it. Prior knowledge, like text, must be exploited as a resource for making and monitoring meaning for, and for careful reasoning. In short, what we need is a balanced view of close reading that matches our purposes in supporting learning in all phases. Well, my benediction, my hope for the standards, I'm hanging in there for the near term. You know, still the best game in town. And they're moving in the right direction in terms of reading theory and research and deeper, toward deeper learning. And I'm hoping that they prove to be a living document that are, that's regularly revised as we uh, learn more about reading and as we learn more about the consequences of their use and the shortcomings that they exhibit in practice. And if we can do those things, I think we can keep all this in proper perspective. And I wish you um, happy close reading in your classrooms. <laughs>